Let us begin with a little thought experiment. Close your eyes. Now I want you to try and picture an apple. What do you see? Perhaps you can see an apple in your mind. Maybe you could even manipulate it, move it around. Maybe some of you can even interact with it, touch it. But some of you might just see nothing. Just blankness. Well then you're like me. But why so? Do we not know what an apple looks like? Well of course we do. It's red, it's round, it has a stalk. We know from memory what an apple is, but our brain cannot form the mental imagery to allow us to picture one. It's called aphantasia, and to me at least, it's one of the most fascinating things about the human mind. It's also highly mysterious. We don't entirely know how it works, how it comes about, what it relates to. This is mostly because it's a relatively new field of study and most people don't even know about it. In fact, I'm willing to bet that there will be people watching this video who just found out they had aphantasia 30 seconds ago. But what is it and what does it mean? Join me as I go through its history as well as to summarise the state of research that we currently have on it. Aphantasia was actually first observed and described all the way back in 1880 by an English polymath called Francis Dalton in a statistical study that he did about mental imagery. He found it to be a fairly common occurrence among scientists of all people. Now, Dalton was a nasty piece of work who also supported eugenics, but even a broken clock could be right twice a day. He wrote, quote, To my astonishment, I found that the great majority of the men of science to whom I first applied protested that mental imagery was unknown to them, and they looked upon me as fanciful and fantastic in supporting the words mental imagery really expressed what I believed everybody supposed them to me. They had no more notion of its true nature than a colourblind man who had not discerned his defect has of the nature of colour. A French psychologist also wrote about what he called a typographic visual type among some of his patients. He described that rather than the word dog being accompanied by an image of a dog, it was instead accompanied by seeing the word dog printed in their mind. However, other than these two instances, the unnamed phenomenon remained almost completely understudied for about a hundred years. It seemed as though scientists just went, oh that's cool, and then moved on to whatever else they were studying at the time. It wasn't until 2005 that a professor at the University of Exeter, Adam Zeman, began the process of shedding more light on this mysterious phenomenon. A man had approached Zeman, saying that he'd lost the ability to visualise after undergoing some minor surgery. In 2010, the details of the patient's case were published, after which numerous other people approached Zeman reporting a lifelong inability to visualise. In 2015, Zeman and his team would publish a paper on what they termed congenital aphantasia, the paper used the Vividness of Visual Imagery Questionnaire, or the VVIQ test, created in 1973 by David Marks, to evaluate the mental imagery capacity of 21 self-diagnosed and self-selected participants. It was identified that aphantasics only lack voluntary mental imagery, but most still obtain the ability to dream. This observation has led some to argue that we must amend our definition of dreams to incorporate aphantasia as the fact that most aphantasics still dream suggests that dreams are an involuntary form of visualisation. Following on from Siemens' work, two researchers at the University of New South Wales, Rebecca Kyo and Joel Pearson, published a paper in 2017 measuring the sensory capacity of mental imagery using binocular rivalry and imagery-based priming. Binocular rivalry is the phenomenon where visual perception will alternate between two different images based on when they're presented to each eye. Well, priming is the idea that your exposure to one stimulus will influence your response to a subsequent one. They observed that self-reported aphantasics showed almost no perceptual priming compared to non-aphantasics. The pair of them would also publish a follow-up paper in 2020, illustrating measurable differences in visual imagery, this time by indirectly measuring the activity of the visual cortex of the brain. There have also been studies conducted into how aphantasia can affect our body's other senses and also our memory. A 2020 study found that aphantasics experience reduced mental imagery from other senses too, as well as having less vivid autobiographical memories about their own lives. A follow-up study in 2022 found that they also exhibit deficits in many other forms of memory too. One of the areas that they don't show reduced capacity in, however, is spatial memory, the ability to know our environment and orient ourselves in the world, where things are, where they have been, etc. A 2021 2021 study found in the journal Cortex sought to quantify aphantasia through drawing and found that while aphantasics show deficits in object memory, they observe no such deficit in their spatial memory. In summary, aphantasia can cause deficit in many but not all areas of cognition.
There have also been studies done on how aphantasia affects the way we express emotions such as fear, specifically how much we sweat when we're frightened. A 2021 study, researchers had a group of both aphantasics and non-aphantasics read a fear-inducing book and then look at some fear-inducing images. And they found that while the two groups exhibited a similar level of response to the images, in the reading experiment, the aphantasics experienced almost a flatline response compared to the non-aphantasics. This would make a lot of sense, as people with aphantasia wouldn't be able to picture what they were reading. Studying aphantasia has also helped us in other areas of the brain. For example, in 2021, a study sought to understand how people with aphantasia get around their inability to visualise, or rather how their brain does. And through this work, we were able to discover that visual and working memory are not the same thing. They are distinct, and people with aphantasia still retain accuracy in their working memory. They just have a different strategy of getting around it. Also in 2021, a study was published related to aphantasia and autism. And the study found that those with aphantasia reported more autistic traits in the general population. As mentioned earlier, not all cases of aphantasia are congenital. Some are acquired, either through brain injury or psychological causes like trauma. There's even been research done into whether it could be an effect of COVID-19 after a case was revealed where an illustrator suddenly lost his ability to imagine and dream following a case of COVID. Studies have also found that aphantasia exhibit differences in reaction time during a visual search task. In the experiment, two groups, with and without aphantasia as before, were presented with a target word and a distractor word. Both groups ex experienced a similar drop in reaction times when they underwent priming. However, when they switched from words to images, while both groups' reaction times decreased, the disparity between them grew, with aphantasics being slower. A 2023 study explored this further and found that aphantasics were also slower at solving hidden object puzzles. In other words, we suck at Where's Waldo. So how common is it? A 2022 study attempted to estimate this by screening undergraduate students, as well as inviting people to take part in an online version of the VVIQ test. They found that around 0.8% experienced an inability to form mental images, while a further 3.1% were found to have very dim mental imagery abilities. As of right now, there's not an agreement on how best to describe and classify aphantasia. Some suggest that it's best described as a malfunction of the episodic system, and thus should be classified as an ep episodic system condition. There's also a debate about whether or not aphantasia could be a progressive condition. If it is, then it may be a harbinger of progressive neurodegenerative diseases like dementia, which would greatly help us in being able to diagnose it earlier. Now, I know that was a lot of research I just threw at you, so now I want to just have a bit of a ramble and talk about my own personal experience with aphantasia. I didn't find out that I had aphantasia until probably 12 to 18 months ago. I found out from a podcast, of all things. One of the hosts was talking about how they can't see things in their own head and how it's apparently this rare thing called aphantasia, and I was like, is that normal? I thought everybody saw nothing. I guess it's because the topic of what you see in your mind doesn't come up very often. So many people can live large chunks of their lives without even knowing they have aphantasia, or what it even is. As far as I can remember, my aphantasia is the congenital kind. I've never been able to form mental imagery. And with that realisation, certain things in my childhood did seem to make more sense. I remember specifically in an English class that I once had, we were told to close our eyes and then listen to a piece of music, and then write a piece describing what we saw when we listened to it. And I struggled with it, for reasons I didn't understand at the time, because I was like 9 or 10, but now that they make more sense, I couldn't picture anything. I also like to think about how aphantasia can affect one's outlook on life and the world around you. I mean, this is just me spitballing, because I have no actual evidence to back this up, but I feel as though my aphantasia does have an impact on my more pessimistic view of the world, since I'm unable to visualise a better one. I've also long thought about that it could explain why I used to suck so much at creative subjects compared to subjects like science and mathematics, which were my strong suits. When I try to create, I struggle taking things beyond basic concepts. Perhaps because I can't see how my work will look as I develop it. Again, this is all just my theories, but if any researchers are watching this video and you're as curious as I am, then I'm always willing to let you pick my brain on the subject. Like I said, I think it's important to not let the lack of mental imagery seem like a burden, because the truth is it isn't. It doesn't really affect my life all that much, not in ways that can't be overcome anyway. If you have a fantasia and you're watching, don't let it fool you into believing that you can't do amazing things. Aphantasia, like many things to do with the brain, is quite personal, and will vary from person to person. It just means we're different, and there's something quite fantastic about that, isn't there? 
If you don't get that reference, it means you haven't watched Protest Mr. Fox. And if you haven't watched that movie, then shame on you. Go watch it. And I should probably make a video explaining why it's so good. Anyway, my point is that if you're sat there thinking that it's some sort of hindrance to you, or you can't do things that may change the world because you have a Fantasia, take this away from the video. Ed Catmull is a computer science genius who co-founded Pixar, and had a hand in creating some of the most whimsical, imaginative, and beloved films that we all remember today. He has a Fantasia. It doesn't stop him from doing great things, so it won't stop you either.